and thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, in this paper, I will use key examples from the copy collection at the V&A to demonstrate how the value of copies lies far beyond that of its relationship to the original, and will instead explore the afterlife of the copy, both at the museum and beyond the wider cultural landscape. The paper will also explore the ongoing relationship between the copied and the copy, and will investigate how, in contrast to popular opinion, the copy can provide authenticity. But first, a little bit of background about our collection. Copies were collected at the V&A from the outset in materials including plastercast, electrotype, brass rubbings, watercolours and photographs. The aim was that together copies and original works of art could create a Victorian encyclopaedia of international art and a design source book to educate, inspire and inform public taste. In 1873, the purpose-built cast courts opened to the public to great acclaim, with the builder stating that the impression they make is indelible. The boldness of the idea, the height of the apartments, the magnitude of many of the objects with which they are filled, and the beauty of others all concur to produce a lasting effect. Designed by Major General Henry Scott, architect of the Royal Albert Hall, they were first called the Architecture Courts and displayed the museum's rapidly growing collection of large-scale casts, alongside original stone fragments. Despite the popularity of the collection having waned in the mid-20th century, the cast courts are one of the few spaces within the museum whose function has not changed, and as you can see in these two images, they today look little different from when they first opened. As you may know, the galleries have recently undergone a complete renovation, and a new interpretation gallery runs down the centre. The aim of the project was to update the galleries for 21st century audiences, whilst retaining the awe and splendour of the original 19th century galleries. Although we have purposefully endeavoured to retain the original look of the galleries, our attitude to interpreting these objects has changed. Previously, the interpretation focused on what these objects are copies of, whereas the labels and films have now been updated to focus on what we know about the copy. In some cases, this is quite little, but where possible, within the 60-word uh, label limit, we have focused on the lives of the copy, the makers, and its materiality. The larger objects, three new publications, and the new gallery have also created more space and opportunity to do this. I should say that this is a work in progress, and we will continue to research and add information where possible. In this short paper today, I wanted to share with you some of our new discoveries, which demonstrate the significance of the copy and show how reproductions create their own authenticity and have their own biography. The cast of Trajan's Column is the largest object in the museum and was acquired in 1864. It was installed in the gallery in 1873 uh, and in the right-hand photograph you can see how the 520 individually numbered panels were installed in two halves onto purpose-built brick cores. The cast is a third generation reproduction, a copy of a copy of a copy, and has today come to be almost as famous as the celebrated original. It was made as a result of a commission by Napoleon III in 1861. Two plaster casts were made of the original, one was given to the Pope and one travelled to Paris. An electrotype of the Paris cast was then made for display at the Louvre, and it was from this copy that the V&A's commission cast was made. Casting from electrotypes was not uncommon, nor was electrotyping from plaster casts, but never before had it been achieved so successfully on such a scale. Other reproductions do exist, but the V&A copy is the only version mounted to display the plaster cast as a column. Therefore, it is the most complete and accurate reconstruction of the celebrated original. The object has stood in its current location since 1873, and stands today as a living document of its life in the museum, demonstrating how approaches to conservation, museum display, and attitudes to replicas have changed in the last 150 years. However, in the early 20th century, the copy's reputation deteriorated as the museum's focus shifted from being a school of art towards becoming a national treasure house. In 1934, Eric McLagan, then director of the V&A, embarked on a campaign to relocate the cast. He wrote to the British Museum stating that its presence here is, of course, an anomaly, as well as a prodigious inconvenience. <laughs> His suggestion was that this most incongruous white elephant be cut up into pieces and moved into the British Museum's collection of casts. He also wrote to a number of other organisations as well. But thankfully, he was unable to convince another institution to rehouse the cast. And this year, our cast will be included in a new publication on the museum's top ten objects. 
These changing attitudes demonstrate how attributions of value are in constant flux, and so is the perception of aura. The building of the caste courts assisted in establishing the caste aura, and the gallery setting has been significant in creating the object's authenticity by association of place and memory. However, as the director's quotes demonstrate, the caste commanding um, location in the museum's grand galleries is not enough on its own to certify its aura. Rather, the perception of its aura is in flux and is subject to prevailing taste and trends. <coughs> but as we all know, copies are very on trend at the moment. And in the first six months of opening, we have had 280,000 people visit the new galleries. However, prior to this project, these galleries, though popular, had been a little forgotten. And audience research realised that many visitors did not know these objects were copies. And when they discovered this, were quite disappointed. To confuse things further, the gallery in between the cast courts used to be a fakes gallery, which did not help the perception <laughs> that these objects are not fakes, but important objects in their own right. As such, we have now put copying at the forefront. For Trajan's column, this means putting th this story at the forefront, and as part of the redevelopment, the inside of the column has been opened up to the public for the first time. Visitors are invited to sit and marvel at this space, while reading a new gallery book which relays this story in further depth. By opening up the column, we may aim to make it very clear that this object is a copy, with its own history and significance, relating to, but separate to that of the original. The inside of our copy couldn't be more different from the series of marble chambers and winding staircase inside the original. The brick core is reminiscent of an industrial chimney and is itself untidy and was clearly constructed quickly and not intended to be seen by the public. Holes on the inside of the brickwork uh, still show where the scaffolding required for construction was once secured and timbers left in place in the upper section of each half are the remains of working platforms used by the engineers. Inscriptions of the names who installed it are inscribed at the top. These features are evidence of the life of the object, provide important insights into Victorian display practice, and demonstrate an advanced application of material and engineering at such great scale. Showing the workings of this object does not detract from the experience of the object's aura, but rather is central to it. Moreover, by focusing on the object's biography and the networks of people, places and creativity, we celebrate the human endeavour, skill and ingenuity of this cast. Our cast has accrued value through this complex history and its life in the museum, which has helped establish both its aura and authenticity. The original is one of the most famous objects in the world, and the lives of the original and the copy are inextricably linked. However, by opening up the column, we hope to make it clear that this object is not merely a replica, but an object in its own right, with a separate function, with its own network of relationships and specific value. Despite all this, modernist theories by the likes of Walter Benjamin continue to influence contemporary perception. As such, authenticity is generally associated with original historic objects. Within a museum full of amazing originals, it can be very difficult to convince visitors that reproductions are as valuable and as interesting as other objects. In fact, recently I heard a volunteer guide take a group through the cast course, and he concluded by saying, don't wor worry, we will go and see some real objects now. <laughs> <laughs> However, outside of the museum context, copies can more easily offer authenticity. For example, during the 20th century, a desperate need for space after the war led to the destruction, sale, or transfer of cast and electrotypes to other collections, and demonstrates the status of copies at this time. In 1947, over 800 electrotypes were sold to the film studio MGM. As such, thereafter, electrotypes have been used in numerous films, including Ben-Hur, Indiana Jones, Game of Thrones and Harry Potter, to name but a few. For the film industry, it is the copy that offers authenticity. To conclude this discussion of aura and authenticity, I wanted to draw your attention briefly to look at the Temperance Basin, one of the most copied and adapted artworks of the Renaissance. Designed in around 1585 by the French model carver and medalist Francois Briot, the cast pewter dish was reproduced immediately by the French potter Bernard Palissy. In the early 17th century, the Nuremberg artist Caspar Enderlein engraved new moulds based on Briot's dish, and thereafter new versions emerged in a whole variety of materials, some of which can be seen here and are displayed in the new gallery. 
For 19th century art schools, the dish offered a lesson in art history, as well as a model for copying, and the dish came to serve as design models, exhibition souvenirs and sports trophies. In 1850, Prince Albert gave Queen Victoria a temperance basin converted into a table for her birthday. Today, it is more famously known as the trophy given to the winner of the Ladies' Singles Championships at Wimbledon. The winner holds aloft a silver version and then takes home a slightly smaller electrotype copy. For the new gallery, we have brought this story up to date by creating a new resin version to continue this story of replication and material innovation. With this reproduction, as for many, the notion of which version is the most authentic or holds the most powerful aura would depend on who was contemplating it. For a renaissance or metalware expert, the original uh, pewter dish would hold the most value and thus be the most authentic. However, for the majority, it would be the 19th century Wimbledon version, which holds the most powerful aura, owing to its connection with the celebrity of the sporting world. Thus, it is important to remember that each reproduction has its own form of aura and authenticity, but equally that the relationship between the copied and the copied is in flux and can reinforce the significance of each other. The introduction of 3D imaging has inevitably renewed and invigorated debates around authenticity and aura, and has also presented new challenges regarding copyright. This can be seen very simply in the contrast between Henry Cole's Convention for Promoting Universal Reproductions of Works of Art in 1867 and the updated REACH Declaration in 2017. Both agreed to make works of art accessible for copying, however Cole's was three pages long and mainly signatures, whereas REACH is quite a tomb and further demonstrates how attitudes to cast have changed. I do not have time in this paper today to explore further the issue of aura and authenticity in relation to 3D technology, but this is something we have explored in the new gallery and in a recent Friday Late. Therefore, I would, wanted to quickly show you one of the objects we have reproduced for the gallery. This copy is displayed in the new gallery as part of a display exploring the value of copying today and which stresses the value of 3D imaging for de democratising collections and encouraging material and technological innovation. Uh, please come talk to me afterwards if you want to hear more about what we've been doing with this. We've also produced three new books which explore the different facets of copying and the connecting networks of people, materials and places which underlie these. As I said, this work is ongoing and we have not yet had the opportunity to turn our attention to every object in the same way that we have to Trajan's Column. I hope this paper has shown how the concept of originality, or and authenticity differs from instance to instance and relies more on the object's cultural biography, setting, and networks of people and places surrounding it than the notion of the copy and copied. Thank you very much.